once more a little bit. Um, because I've got a few questions, it might be answered and might be raised by other ones as well. Um, so I, I've always been talking about Gaussian distribution, but we never uh, even thought of if this is something Gaussian that we're looking at here. So um, we're still within the moist data set, and kind of, it might be a good idea to look at a histogram. So we use hist noise dollar zinc. Ah, here is the parameter. MF. Yeah, that's better. <coughs> and this is obviously something skewed. So uh, we need to think about how to get this look at least a bit more Gaussian. Um, so this is still a bit off, and we seem to get even a bimodal distribution of, of some sort. Um, but I suggest we, we stay for lock. So we assume a lock normal distribution. And um, so now we have to fit a different variogram because now we're working on a completely different scale. So these values are now between 4 and 8, but the values before, uh, if you look at the histogram, this one here are between 0 and almost 2,000. So we're a completely different scale. We get a completely different variogram. So we have to do the full analysis once more. But it's rather easy. You can simply actually really put the log function into the uh, functional argument of the variogram. <coughs> so this gets us a different variogram, but now you see the gamma values are on a completely different scale. Earlier we had values up to 150,000, now we're somewhere in between 0 and 0 0.6 maybe. But besides the different scale, we uh, simply proceed as earlier, despite the starting values. So the huge numbers in here have been starting values for the variogram optimization. And um, it's, you always have to provide starting values that are in the same order of magnitude than the uh, experimental sample variogram that you would like to model. So 150,000 was a good starting value for the zinc values directly, but log zinc. Um, so what is it? It's a partial set. I, I don't uh, provide the argument names to the function VGM because it's the same order as in the definition of the function. And the order is within this uh, drop-down menu. So the first is the partial sill. This is the partial sill of the explained effect. So if we look into the our empirical, um, we see, okay, 0 0.6 seems to be the overall sill. And 0 0.1 might be the nugget. So 0 0.5 might be a sensible starting value for the partial sill of the spatial effect. Then we stay within the spherical family. The range of 1,000 might be better with 800. And the nugget we just guessed could be something close to 0 0.1. So we can fit the variogram, and if we look at it, um, we get an even smaller nugget, 0 0.06, uh, an even larger partial sill for the explained effect in range of 965 meters. So this seems to be quite low. Um, we would have to do the same changes to all of these to get them through the fitting process. Otherwise, you might get numbers, but they won't mean a lot for your process. So we have four new fitted variograms, and can now look at the plots. So here's our linear friend again. The spherical model looks a bit nicer. Exponential goes a bit more further up, and the Martian class has again this uh, kind of S-type shape. And we get, of course, different differences. Now the differences are very, very small. So we have the power to 10 to the power of minus 5 here. Um, 
1.39, 1 1.15, so matern is better than linear. Um, exponential seems to be worse than linear, and spherical is our best friend here. Um, but for the quitting, of course, we would have to provide log zinc as well, because otherwise the quitch function wouldn't know that it's log transform virogram, and would try to make some sense out of the other one. And um, this is spherical, we decided. And here is the map that we get. But now this map is still on the log scale. And we have to back transform it to something more useful. So we can say more screech to get something like exp zinc. And this is simply the exponent. Uh, the e to the power of more screeched uh, variable one dot prediction and now it's a different map we can plot x zinc which gives us value like this compared to earlier plots kind of these low values, they seem to be uh, much more constant, closer to each other, and a bit more connected. Compared to the earlier plots, we had kind of m more scattered uh, regions of different colors. But kind of what remains is very high value down here, and high values up here after this small bend of the river. What was I looking for? So just to connect to Tom's session here, I uh, wanted to use the library plot KMO to kind of plot the Moist data set there, but you have to provide a projection. So I hope this one is the correct one for the Moist data set. And um, Moist. Four string. Because if PlotKML doesn't know what kind of projection you have been using and what kind of command reference system, it doesn't know where on the globe to put uh, the values. And once you have a well prepared data set, you simply call plot KML, name of the data set, name of the variable, just as you would do for plotting. And then you get kind of some points nicely put on a map. And kind of the size and the color of the bubbles now indicate the sink concentrations. And you can see here that you kind of 
is the river kind of running around the study area where you have the different observations. And those here all lying along the river have considerably larger values than these values lying somewhere in the back in these uh, agricultural fields. And here seems a very high value uh, in this kind of strong band of the river. We'll uh, use plot camera once more later for temporal data. There's any kind of uh, nice animations how the spatial temporal measurements change over space and time. You can it run in a loop and uh, look at it. But kind of on the R side, it's, it's just kind of nicely composed. So it's just a single line that you write, and uh, you get the KML file. It opens up Google Earth, and you're kind of ready to browse your data set and look at it. I said earlier that when you do transformation of your data set, you get in trouble with the back transformation. So kind of um, we have we, we kind of ignored it for now. But there's the function creech tg, so this is trans Gaussian creeching, um, where this back transformation is taken care of. So if you use the function creech tg for trans Gaussian creeching, then you kind of can make a proper back transformation uh, to get better estimates of uh, your variable that you have been predicted. But this kind of might go too far for now. Um, any questions for the spatial case? Ah, <laughs> uh, it, it should be in the help files, I uh, believe. Yeah, this uh, would have been even easier. So uh, if you have a data set and you have no clue what the coordinate reference system is, you're in trouble. So there's no good solution how to guess your coordinate reference system. Um, it should be somewhere. Your data provider should be able to tell you what kind of reference system has been used, what is it, what you're looking at. Here it is in the help files. It would have been easier than Googling it, but it's kind of um, so well and widely studied that uh, Google might always be of help if you're looking at the moist data set. And um, kind of most helpful is mostly just kind of this, this first string is enough, so you don't have to provide all these additional details. It just says, uh, initiate a project for string based on EPSG uh, 28992. So if you have the EPSG code, you are already on the safe side and can just kind of generate project for strings from it. But at times, um, if you have the same kind on the same project for string, once based on the init and once based on the kind of outwritten statement, you might still get complaints from SP because it, at times it only makes an, or to a certain degree, it only makes a little comparison. Then it kind of still means the same thing, but doesn't look the same written out. And that's kind of where you then have to kind of manually reset the coordinate reference system to the same exact value uh, to get around this warning or this error at times. Okay, so let's start with this um, spatial temporal. So we need a different data set. And isn't it rural? Yeah. 
So now we need as well the library space time for an obvious reason to have our spatial temporal data sets. And we look at the data set, I think it's called. Uh, let's clear the workspace first so that we see what happens. So data air brings up um, an object called rule that is a spatial temporal full data frame. So let's look into rural. And you will notice that it's rather large. So the time series starts, um, well, it actually starts the first day of 1998 and lasts until the last day of 2009. So we have more than 4,000 temporal instances and we have a spatial locations up to 70. That's not too many. So we kind of have more than 300,000 observations in the complete spatial temporal full grid, but there are kind of plenty of an ace in it. So there are many, many missing values um, that are still in this object because it's a spatial temporal full data frame. Just to recall from Edsar's session, that the full data frame always assumes that you have a value, it might be an A, but that you have a value recorded for every point in space and point in time as a cross product. So assume for every spatial location you have a value at every time point and for every time point for each station you're looking at. So if you kind of would make it this data frame into a sparse data frame, uh, it would change a lot. And kind of instead of SP plot, there's now ST plot to plot, but um, What? Um, you're better off not plotting the whole thing because then you kind of have to wait a couple of minutes. So let's look at 2005 June. And we look at PM10. Oh, there's only PM10. Okay. It kind of brings up the full June, um, just kind of as a series of plots next to each other. This kind of, you're getting always in trouble with daylight saving times and different time zones. So really to get the timings really nice here, because we ask for June, but kind of the first title is uh, 31st of May. Um, it's always a bit more of extra trouble. It's just kind of because there's a time shift in between and it depends on the time zone of your computer, so it might even look different on your screens than it does here on, on the uh, projector. So it's, uh, time is always a bit of a problem, but uh, for now it's only name. So it's, it, it doesn't really make a difference if the title is 31st or if it's 1st of June. Uh, it is, but um, it takes a bit more effort to kind of to download the map to make it in the right projection. So it doesn't come automatically with the data set? No, this data set is really pure points. And, and besides the bounding box, you have no clue where they might be. Okay. Yeah. And because we don't want to work with a full data set always, we say uh, we now only look at June and just kind of cut out the June and if you now look at the structure uh, we still have the 70 locations but we only have a bit more than 2000 points of which several are empty and uh, 30 time instance, which is kind of June, makes sense. So it seems to be the right 
object we're looking at and seems to be what we have been looking for. So we'd like to know how many NAs are there. So simply take the sum of the function is an A of rural June of data of PM10. So we get a rate of more than 30% of the data, almost 40% is, is missing in this case. So there's a bit more noise in it than you would assume. Which depends on kind of maybe um, the 70 stations are all stations that have been in use over this long time series from 1998 to 2009. So there might be stations that are not operable, that not that don't operate anymore, still as point in the data set, but they don't have any point for June. So it kind of would have to do some cleaning to drop out those locations that don't provide any values here. So what we'd like to see is a sample virogram. So we ask virogram. Variogram st, and it works the same way. We have to provide the formula PM10 just based on coordinates. Uh, have to provide the locations or the data set. So we will provide rural June, and it's always a good idea to provide time lags. The default is a bit um, optimistic. I think it's zero to ten. And let's say cutoff of 1,000 kilometers. Takes a bit longer, but kind of we're doing much more calculations. And of course, we do have many more points. So let's see if this worked as assumed. it didn't because distances are in kilometers. So we asked for a cutoff of one million kilometers and this was pretty far from everything possible. And still we see that for Germany it doesn't make really sense to look for distances larger than 800 kilometers. So we might be better off by 500. This looks a bit better. Mm. Let me check. For some reason, I'm not so sure about why. It looks a bit different than I expected it. Let's see what we can do about it. Um, so let's check for the number of points. I presume you know this, this dollar sign to get kind of into different entries of a list. And if you don't know the names of the list, you can simply type dollar and then press tab. You kind of get this drop down menu of, of different names of list entries uh, out of this structure you're looking at. And NP is always first prepared to look at if something goes wrong. Um, and though it doesn't sound to be too bad. Hmm. 
que ça sonne, là c'est le cas. So we seem to still have this strange artifact here of very high values for the second leg class. Let's see for VGMST. So this is copied from the help page, so you don't have to redefine all the standard models here from the help page of VGMST. Then the examples give an example for a separable model, how it is defined and so on. And uh, what we need to know... some more explanation here. Um, even though the sample diagram doesn't look like how we would like to see it, um, I have to think about why later. Uh, we still could try to fit a model to it, kind of in the... Uh, kind of this column is somewhat unexpected to see so high values here, so it would be more expected to be... Um, more incremental, and kind of, it's supposed, to, it should be the same data set as I used on the slides, and the slides look slightly different, so I have to double check what I did different. If it's just kind of uh, placement of bins, number of points per bin, I can't tell right now, I have to double check, but this might take a time. Let you can kind of do later on when you kind of uh, continue here, and I kind of might double check it. Um, but for now, we can kind of use it as it is. To fit one, we define the separable model here. So we use VGMST to define the model. Say it's a separable one. We have a spatial component. We have a temporal component. We have a joint cell. And here as well, the joint cell can be read from, from this plot. So this ranges up to 45. 40 is kind of the color that kind of is in large areas up here. So 40 might be a good starting value. So these are, again, all starting values to get the optimization running. And um, kind of what is special about the separable model, again, is that it has a single joint cell for everything. And the spatial and temporal variagrams, they have <coughs> only a joint cell uh, of one together. 
So kind of the explained component has a certain ratio and the unexplained nugget has a certain ratio, but they both always add up to one. They're um, so-called uh, correlograms because they don't go for the covariance, they go for the correlation that's limited to one. I'm going to redefine this as a prototypical model, let the optimization run, and when we kind of call the model, we get a small description of the spatial component, which models are used, nugget and exponential, the rates between them, the range. So the spatial range is here something like 600 meters. And the time component has a range like 1.5 days. So it's like over one and a half days of temporal distance, the points seem to be uncorrelated over time already. And an estimate for the joint cell here is almost 40, so 40 seems to be a good starting point. And we don't have any temporal nugget. So the full the joint cell is completely attributed to the temporal explained component. So the nugget seems to be captured completely in the spatial model here. And we would like to know how well did we perform in terms of uh, sum of squared errors. So we're looking for the attribute uh, optim output. So those of you who have used the optimize function know that it kind of produces a list of outputs, like a convergence message, uh, kind of the optimization value, and of course the estimate and um, we kind of attach this full list as attributes to the diagram model that we fitted. So we can ask for this attribute from the object fit separable model. This has to be a character, so in quotes. If we ask for all of it, we get the complete output of our uh, optimization technique. And you see here the parameters. So the parameters are in order range spatial, nugget spatial, range temporal, nugget temporal, and the sill. And we can as well just look at the value. Because value is kind of the function that is optimized calculates the mean squared error between surface and sample and the value is then the smallest value that has been generated during the optimization. So if you ask for the value here from the optimized output, uh, you can compare different models. Fit product sum model. So provide again the sample diagram and the product sum model. And if you now look at the fitted product sum model, we get slightly different output. Uh, we see that. Um, we don't have single nuggets for the spatial and temporal components. They are set here to zero, but they are even completely dropped. Um, this is by definition. This is not output of the model fit, but for the product sum model, we don't have nuggets in the spatial and temporal component. We only have a single joint nugget over the full um, spatial memory field. The nugget is here uh, estimated to six, the sill to 36, and kind of both components have an own sill that's almost as high as the overall sill. And here we have only a spatial ra range of 340 meters and a temporal range of 5 meters. But this is uh, due to the structure of the product sum model not so easily really translated 
uh, into spatial and temporal components on its own because you're always looking at the kind of product of both. So the, the structure is a bit more complicated and it's not uh, easy to really be read and translated to a model. And the optimization didn't to do well, it seems, because we have a, a larger error than we had for the Shepard model. For visual comparison, we can again do plot, sample diagram, and now we could, for instance, provide as a list the fit of the product sum model, well, in the same order maybe, and the fit of the separable model. And so we kind of get plot of what we did. Or if we set the argument wireframe true, we get these. But in this case, it might be easier this way around. Um, how did you get the starting parameter for the value jump? Uh, kind of again by looking at the um, empirical one. So if you just plot sample diagram, um, kind of the overall sill is something you can guess, the nugget is something you can guess, and the space and time component um, are typically close to the overall sill, but uh, then kind of it starts like try and error. It's hard to to guess them, especially you have to fulfill these conditions. If you remember the uh, K1, K2, K3 from the kind of theoretical slides, uh, those have to be kind of fulfill certain conditions and um, it remains a bit try and error. So they have to be smaller than the overall cell. Each of them separately, for instance, that's something you have to look for. And um, you, you try your first, see how well they perform, and might change them again towards more useful direction. What's surprising for the product sum model here is the... Um, where's the model? Here's the model. It seems to have a way longer temporal range and a shorter spatial range, which kind of results in this surprising looking plot here. It almost seems, oh, if you, it's more surprising this way. So here it already looks, almost looks like we kind of twisted the data set somehow. But this might be just a problem, well, of starting parameters and, um, we could try to do better. So yes, this is sensitive to starting parameters, which is a bad thing, but it's kind of the problem of the numerical optimization that we're going through. Or even scaling the distances, 
which has been an easy workaround earlier. Well, it might just not be possible to get a better model, so it's not. Uh, it might not be a numerical issue. It might just be that it's not well suited for this sample, especially as the sample diagram looks a bit different than I kind of uh, used it in the slides. Yeah, it doesn't seem to like, they don't seem to like, ah. Um. Once you start to try to help optimize to get a better result, you pretty easily mess up your data set. So how no matter to, to turn and to twist it, it kind of seems to be at least around the error of eight, so. Yeah, true, the first, first one was the best one. wouldn't say this is on purpose, but this is at least um, an honest picture of how easy it is to model spatial temporal diagrams. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, you're minimizing the difference between <coughs> surface and sample. 
Yeah. So there can be an identification problem in this case. Yeah. So we try to calibrate the, the parameters, the starting point of the parameters in order to avoid this. Yeah, yeah. To kind of to, to get into different local minima maybe or kind of to get out of the dangerous zone. Um, Ah, yeah, you can, um, the fit ST diagram definition has the dot, dot, dot argument here, and these dots are passed on to optim. So all the arguments you have in the optim function, you can kind of pass through here. And lower is an optim argument that defines the lower boundary of the parameters. So by um, this 200 means, for instance, that the spatial range should, it be, should be at least 200 kilometers. So we kind of give it some, some, some boundary to better decide where to look for useful parameters. And the one is in the temporal range. That's better somehow. Um, kind of as a small task for you, I would kind of suggest to, to try out. Um, either continue with this not completely nicely shaped uh, empirical virogram and just try the other, the metric model, the summatic model, and kind of as a small competition, we're kind of looking for the smallest error. So kind of combine uh, exponential, spherical, Martian classes, kind of looking for the smallest error between surface and empirical one. Or um, kind of a little bit more nicely behaving sample diagram, you could load data VV, which is the sample diagram um, of the same type. So it is as well deduced from the same data set but obviously with some slightly different parameters looking a bit more better. So you could use this one here instead of the uh, sample VGM. I could look into it for now. As you prefer, you can as well kind of look into your own data set or into the uh, spatial, into the uh, interpolation competition data set if you want to do it spatial temporal like. So, um, And whenever you have questions how this or that should work or why it doesn't work as it should, I'm here. And in the meantime, I'll try to figure out why this program looks different. So I might be able to answer this.
the cat off to 730, that would make sense. The time at uh, 3 parameter, the cat off parameter. Just before, uh, because to avoid the large number. Mm. I would say it's still too large. Okay, it must be smaller. Yeah, yeah, so kind of. To the 730, you still kind of runs across Germany uh, uh, as a distance, okay. and you're probably better off <laughs> looking so more closely. So what does the cutoff say exactly? Uh, the cutoff is the maximum distance of point pairs that you consider for the sample diagram. Uh, well, in the unit of your um, data set. So if you have projections in meters, then it's in meters. If you have projections in kilometers, then it's kilometers or miles or whatever. So in this case? In this case, it's kilometers. Okay. Yeah. And if it's uh, unprojected, uh, if it's geographic coordinates, then great circle distances in kilometers are calculated. Uh, okay, yeah. so the um, diagram that you can load by data VV is uh, produced on the data between 2005 and 2010, and not just a single month. So that's why they both look so different. It's still the rural data set, but it's a different time frame. That's something I didn't remember quite well here. Yeah. And you kind of, here we suggest a cutoff of 200 and 10 bins of width 20 kilometers. So that's kind of, a, it's a different binning and it's a much larger data set.
And this would be kind of the uh, spatial temporal plot KML version. We can then kind of animate through time or just kind of look at time spans or point in time. And kind of the call is just kind of as simple as it could be plot KML argument that you would like to have plotted. And here we go. Of course, plot KML can do much more, so you can put additional figures to it, uh, color scales, but kind of for the first visualization, just to get an idea of what is happening, it's a nice first shot, nice, nice tool, nice idea to, to look at it. <clears throat> Any promising spatial temporal diagram models already? Any promising models yet? No. Oh. I'm still hoping that somebody comes up with a very brilliant model that kind of solves this strange particular meta problem, but didn't happen so far, I don't know. Did anybody try uh, his own data set or the uh, interpolation competition game data set? Or do you all stick to the VV example? I wanted to try the data set, mm -hmm. but I still the data. Ah, okay. So while some are trying to get a nice model, I could show a few lines on how to um, get the boundaries into the plot. So like how to get the map. So we need a few more packages, uh, map tools, map data, um, to easily kind of get the maps. So uh, from the world high resolution data set, we'd like to have Germany out of this map tool. Um, to do some ID selection to get the names right, to get the uh, coordinates right. So we get Germany, made out of the map, we made a spatial polygons. 
object which needs to become lines and we need to make it the right projection. So it's kind of a bit of technical work you have to do before. And um, we kind of set. Uh, here's some grid generation for the later prediction. But here we go. Here's ST plot including boundaries. These are kind of yeah the ten time steps that you've seen on the slides as well for point locations together with boundaries. Um, to get there, you again plot a spatial temporal full data frame. And you have to define a spatial layout argument. That's basically uh, if we add multiple things like different lines, grids, several point data sets, then it's a list of lists. But in the easiest case, you simply put a list where you say, well, these are spatial lines and they look like gear underscore lines, so the German lines. And then these lines will be added to the plot. So this sp.layout argument can do all those nice additional plots to get many kind of many plots, many figures in the same panel. And uh, then it's kind of automatically reproduced for each panel, so for every day, so you don't have to tell the plotting function, I would like to have the boundaries for every map. So provided once it knows that it kind of belongs to all the maps and uh, you get a bit nicer map that looks something you can understand and read. And at the point in time when you're kind of satisfied with your diagram model and you would like to do prediction, then it again really kind of, you try to mimic the uh, notion of the creature function. Um, there's a creature ST and it's still PM10. You say it from Germany June towards Germany gridded for a certain set of time steps here. So Germany gridded it's a spatial temporal full data frame um, for the full month of June. And you get quite some pixels here. So it's kind of it's spatial temporal full structure. There's no data, so it's not a spatial full data frame. That's just a spatial temporal full object. And with a certain grid topology that we have defined earlier, it gives us a number of uh, pixels. So in this case, only 18 times 15. And then you can do the prediction. It takes a moment, but it's kind of doable to wait for it.
and then you can plot the create the interpolated map. Any questions, any surprises along the way? course you can do afterwards cross validation if you want to kind of uh, do that based on the varigram only it it's, takes some experience to really judge if you should can if you can be satisfied with your model and um, the cross validation the spatial creating function has a nice full creating function creature.cv for cross validation and then kind of the cross-validation is automatically done and you get uh, the full cross-validation results and can do the statistics on it. And uh, the spatial temporal part does it not so far. So we have to do it on your own. So we have to kind of write a loop that iterates over your data set, holds back a single station, predicts this station, and kind of goes on to the next station. You typically do it in the way that you drop full time series. So you go through the data set station-wise, and for every station you drop the station, use your tools to predict the new station, and then you go on to the next station. And then you can compare the time series station-wise, but you typically don't uh, re-estimate the model. So you fit the model once, and then kind of run over the data set, dropping one station after another, predicting the station, and then calculate the differences between prediction and measured values. Which is, well, the complete cross-validation would assume that you would have to fit a model every time you drop a new station. Um, but this is often too much to do, simply. So that's why you assume my model is good for all situations. doesn't depend if there's one or more station, but I want to know how good it is really. But as well as said in the theory part, it doesn't have to be that the best looking virogram as well produces the best um, cross validation statistics. So there are kind of a couple of things happening in between that can kind of influence each other, which is kind of hardly predictable 
what, what happens. So you really kind of it depends on the goodness of fit that you would like to present, which kind of technique you use. Uh, as close as a sample variable. So you try to get as close as possible to the sample variable. But in the um, case I ran into just now with a kind of uh, surprising one color minute, um, there you might argue that it's not very useful to fit to this column because there, there is no model that can model this spike. So the only thing you can do is kind of model a smooth surface through it. So uh, the model fits as far as they can model it at all, might get better if you drop this column. So if you really kind of cut out this piece of the sample diagram that doesn't fit the modeling capabilities that you have. It doesn't mean that it's not there in the data set, but it just means the GSTAT tools are not capable to kind of capture this uh, strange behavior. Uh, Pre-processing might help, so uh, doing kind of regression model first and then applying it to the residuals, the spatial temporal cridging might help to kind of get closer to stationarity, to isotropy, kind of to better fulfill uh, the, the preconditions of cridging. Something like knock transformation? Um, well, getting closer to Gaussian distributions is of course helpful. Uh, it wouldn't really, this, this kind of spike would remain after log transformation as well, but it might change its shape. But still kind of high values are after log transformation still high values, so it doesn't, doesn't do the complete trick. And kind of, uh, the reason why the spatial temporal sample diagrams in the slides look better, it, it was just a different year. So I was looking at 2009, and if you do it for 2009, this, is, this script is as well in the um, Bitbucket repository that I showed you earlier, the space time underscore clean. Uh, there it is done with country boundaries and for the different year, where you have kind of the same looking spatial temporal variable as in the slides. And where now the prediction works as well. Uh, I've been again messing up my distances by scaling and backscaling. That's why it didn't work so well earlier. So um, you really kind of the formula, starting values, target grid, model, be a bit patient, and then you kind of get your interpolated grid. So I suggest for the kind of last, for the first part, um, that you can kind of work on the interpolation comparison game data sets. Uh, I'll be around to answer questions if you got stuck somewhere. Um, I'll be here to kind of explain a bit more on copulas if you like. So if anybody got interested and would like to, to see more copulas or to see simple examples for the multivariate return period case, not even spatially, just kind of stay in, in uh, simpler statistical parts. Um, I'm happy to explain a bit more, or just kind of individually, and then it's more like uh, working on the competition, if you like, trying out this script as well. So the space-time clean script is in the Bitbucket repository, and I'll put it as well on the course page. The course page now has at least the slides, and the first script we used in the morning and uh, kind of I'll put a link here as well, so you can check it out if you like. And they will remain in this Bitbucket repository as well. Break is at three o'clock, right? Yeah. So it's a couple of minutes to go. I'm here whenever you have questions, list it below. And otherwise, thanks a lot for your attention and uh, a couple of hours here. Thank you. <laughs>